An electric motor controller is a device or group of devices that governs in a set way the electric power delivered to the motor it's connected to. Controllers can be simple or they can be complex. You could be working on one small enough to fit in your hand, or you could be called in here for maintenance. This is a motor controller too. Now what we're going to talk about now are magnetic DC motor controllers. In order to troubleshoot them or repair them, you've got to have a general understanding of what a controller is, how it works, and a specific knowledge of how each of the devices in the controller assembly regulates the functions of the motor. Now often you'll hear the terms motor starter and motor controller used interchangeably, and to a degree at least, they are the same. A starter is the simplest form of motor controller. It's capable of starting and stopping a motor, providing it with automatic overload protection and low voltage protection. But for our purposes, we want to use the term controller to mean a device that may include other features as well, such as speed and direction control. And by the way, all of the features I just mentioned will be explained in detail as we go along. Now most controllers fall under two classifications manual or magnetic. You aren't likely to see a manual controller on a DC motor, but there are a couple of facts you should remember about them. First, the operator performs all the control functions. Second, a manual controller usually doesn't provide overload protection. Overload protection is a device designed to de-energize the motor the controller operates if the motor is drawing excessive current. Magnetic controllers are what you'll be working with most often, and they can be divided into two basic types, full automatic and semi-automatic. Both types use electromagnetic switches to perform their control functions. An electromagnetic switch is an electromagnetically operated device that is used to open or close a circuit. There are several types of electromagnetic switches, such as contactors and relays, and we'll discuss each type in detail as we go along. The full automatic type requires no action by the operator. The semi-automatic type requires an operator to start and stop its operation. And what we're going to do at this point is look at a typical magnetic DC motor controller and identify each of the devices that make it up. Explain what they do and how they're operated. Many of the controllers you'll be working with are set up like this one. It's basically a group of devices mounted on a board and placed in a cabinet. We don't have to identify each component on the board because you're already familiar with some of them, like this resistor. So we'll be selective. Earlier, we said that controllers use electromagnetic switches to perform control functions. Now, this switch is called the main contactor. A contactor is a device that's used to open or close a power circuit. This contactor opens or closes the motor circuit. It's got two main sections. One section is fixed to the board. As we describe the parts of this section, we'll describe them as fixed or stationary. The other is called the movable section. It's also attached to the board, but with a pivot. Parts attached to this section are referred to as movable. Now, all magnetic contactors operate on the basis of magnetic attraction. What we've got here is an illustration of a very simple magnetic contactor. Let's identify the parts on the stationary side of the contactor first. These two parts together form the electromagnet. This part's the operating coil. It becomes a magnet when voltage is applied to it. Now inside the operating coil is a metal core. This one's made of iron. The iron core and the coil form the electromagnet. It's part of the magnetic circuit. Right here above the electromagnet is the stationary contact. Here on the movable section, we've got the movable armature. It's made of iron. This is the movable contact. It's connected to the armature. When the operating coil is energized, the armature is attracted to the electromagnet, bringing the movable armature forward, causing these contacts to close and form a path for current from here through the main contactor to here. This spring is called the contact spring. It serves two purposes. It cushions the striking force between the contacts, and it maintains pressure on the contacts when they're closed. When the coil is de-energized, the armature's weight causes it to fall backward. 
the contacts separate, interrupting the current path. Now, these contacts are usually made of good conducting material like silver or copper. Pigtails like this are also made of good conducting material. The pigtail provides a path for current from the movable contact to the circuit. This is the pivot we pointed out before that connects the movable section of the contactor to the fixed section. It allows the armature to move back and forth. This is called the blowout coil. It's connected in series with the contacts, so it forms part of the current path. When these contacts separate, an arc forms between them. The blowout coil is designed to produce a magnetic field between these contacts as they open that forces the arc upward, stretching the arc to the point where it breaks and goes out. Well, we've described the relevant devices in this assembly and what they do. The sequence of operation goes like this. When the coil is energized, it produces an electromagnetic field that attracts the iron armature. The armature is pulled into the electromagnet, closing the movable and stationary contacts. The contact spring cushions the closing force between these two contacts and maintains pressure on them. Now that gives us a current path from the line through the closed contacts through the pigtail to the load. Now when the coil is de-energized, that weight we pointed out causes the armature to fall away from the electromagnet and open the movable and stationary contacts. As the contacts open, an arc forms. The blowout coil produces a magnetic field between the opening contacts, forcing the arc upward and blows it out. Here's another contactor that's a little more complex. It has three movable and three stationary contacts, so it can open or close three electrical lines at the same time. Now, the principle of operation for this contactor is identical to the operation of the one we just saw, but this one uses a spring instead of a weight to cause the armature to move away from the electromagnet after it's been de-energized. This device is also an electromagnetic switch. It's constructed just about the same way and operates on the same principle as a contactor, but it's called a magnetic relay. A magnetic relay is the term used to describe a device that performs a control or intelligence function within a controller. Now, you'll see what I mean by that as we go along. You may have noticed that both the contactors and the relays we've looked at had small contacts attached to them in addition to those identified as the movable and stationary contacts. Now, here's one set, and there's another set there. These contacts are always attached to the armature and operated by it. They're referred to as auxiliary contacts, and they're used to perform auxiliary control functions. Well, now we know pretty much how two major types of electromagnetic switches, contactors and relays, work. And we're familiar with the basic parts that make up the switches. So let's talk a little about how some of the switches are controlled. The first type of control we'll look at is a timing device. It's possible to control the time interval between one operation and another within a controller. You'll hear the term time delay used to describe a device that controls when a contactor or relay function goes into effect. Time delay devices can be either electrical mechanisms or mechanical mechanisms. Let's look at an electrical type first. This one uses the process of induction to delay action. You have to know a little bit about how it's built in order to understand how it works. It looks almost exactly like any other electromagnetic coil, but there's one significant difference. There are a few turns of large wire coiled around the metal core inside this one. This wire is joined together at the ends, forming a complete circuit. Now, sometimes you'll find that a piece of copper tubing is placed around the core instead. Now, the additional winding or tubing doesn't have any noticeable effect on the operation of the relay when the operating coil is energized, but there's a big difference in what happens when the coil is de-energized. The magnetic field around the operating coil collapses, and a voltage is induced in the additional winding. Now, since the ends of the winding are connected together, it forms a complete circuit in itself. The current flow in this self-contained circuit gets very high and creates a very strong magnetic field. This has the effect of holding the armature in place, so the contacts remain closed 
after the coil's been de-energized, and that's how the relay is kept from operating immediately. This particular type of timing device is called an inductive time delay relay. Time delay can also be accomplished using mechanical devices, such as a dash pot or a pneumatic time delay device. A dash pot works a lot like a shock absorber on a car. It's usually placed beneath the pivot point of the movable armature. Now, most dash pots are made of a cylinder containing a hollow piston or plunger that's got holes in it. Inside the cylinder surrounding the piston, there's either a liquid or a gas. Now, the rate of speed at which the piston moves in the cylinder is determined by the amount of time it takes for the liquid or the gas to escape through the holes in the piston. The process goes something like this. The dash pots attach to the movable armature. Now, as soon as the operating coil is energized, the armature moves toward the electromagnet. The time it takes to get there depends on how long it takes for the fluid in the chamber to pass through the piston, being pulled upward by the attraction between the movable armature and the electromagnet. A pneumatic device is connected to the relay the same way the dash pot is, and it operates the same way. It also uses a cylinder with a vent in it and a piston, but the cushioning medium is air. When the operating coil is energized, the armature moves toward the electromagnet. In this case, the rate at which the armature travels depends on the time it takes for the air vent to release the air in the cylinder. Now, sometimes you'll see a pneumatic device that has a flexible airbag called a bellows instead of a cylinder. The bellows can be either full or empty when the coil is de-energized. The speed with which the bag inflates or deflates determines the amount of delay before the armature reaches the electromagnet. Well, most of the time-delayed devices you run into will be similar to the types we just looked at. Let's go on to talk about some devices that are designed to offer protection. The main protective function built into most controllers is overload protection. Now, we're going to concentrate on two kinds of thermal overload protection. One uses a bimetallic element. The other uses a melting alloy. Let's go over how the bimetallic device works first. This is a bimetallic overload relay. It uses a bimetallic strip. That's a strip made up of two different metals fused together side by side, and a heater element. The heater element is connected in series with the motor. It's designed to carry the full load current of the motor without heating. But when the current through the motor increases due to overload, the heater coil starts to heat up reflecting the additional current flow. The bimetallic strip is placed adjacent to the heater coil. One end of the strip is fixed in place. The other is free to move. When the heating coil starts to heat up, the bimetallic strip starts to expand. The strip is composed of two different metals, one more sensitive to heat than the other. When the bimetallic strip is heated, it will bend in a predetermined direction. Bimetallic overload relays are designed so that the bent strip trips a spring-loaded linkage attached to the contacts that forces the contacts to open. This type of overload protection must be reset manually. Now, once the bimetallic strip has cooled down and returned to its original position, a handle or push button is commonly used to reset the contacts. The other type of thermal overload device we mentioned is the melting alloy overload relay. Now, these two devices have a lot in common. They each use a heater element that is connected in series with the motor. This element begins to heat up whenever the amount of current passing through the motor exceeds its full load current. Well, okay, that's the sensing element in this device. Let's look at the other parts. This solder pot is filled with solder that has a low melting point. Inside the solder pot, there's a rod that has a ratchet wheel attached to it. The rod is prevented from moving by the solid solder. The ratchet wheel holds a mechanical linkage in place. The linkage is attached to a set of spring-loaded contacts which open when they're released. It works like this. As soon as the heater element starts to give off heat, the solder melts, freeing the rod. When the rod is free to move, the mechanical linkage, which held the spring-loaded contacts in place, forces the ratchet wheel to turn and the contacts open. On this device, a reset button is used to close the contacts. 
As we said before, starters and controllers can also provide low voltage protection. Of the two commonest types, one is simply called low voltage protection, LVP. The other is called LVR, low voltage release protection. After a voltage drop, a controller equipped with LVP protection must be restarted by the operator after voltage has returned to normal. A controller equipped with LVR protection will restart the motor automatically as soon as voltage has returned to normal. Oh, there's one more fact you need to know. Sometimes you'll hear the term under voltage. It means the same thing as low voltage. The terms are interchangeable. Well, we began by stating the difference between a starter and a controller. From there, we went on to identify the various types of devices commonly found in controllers and described how each device worked. This is a good place to stop and review. Why don't you take some time now to check out what your text has to say on what we've just covered. Well, we've talked about several types of magnetic contactors and relays and how they function within a controller. Now, let's talk about some different types or classifications of controllers. As we said earlier, DC controllers are classified according to the way they're operated. There are two main classifications, manual and magnetic controllers. Manual controllers require that all functions be done by hand. For example, this is a toggle switch controller. The operator turns the switch on and the motor runs. This is a drum switch controller. On this one, the operator turns the handle to start and stop the motor. With this controller, the operator also has the option of being able to control the direction in which the motor turns. Now, neither of these two manual controllers offer the motor any protection at all. The operator is the only protection the motor has. Manual controllers are seldom used with DC motors, so we're not going to say any more about them here. We just wanted to be sure you understood their place in the field of controllers. Magnetic controllers are what we're going to concentrate on from here on in. There are two basic types of magnetic controllers, full automatic and semi-automatic. We're going to drop the term magnetic too. Instead of saying magnetic full automatic and magnetic semi-automatic, we'll probably shorten it to full automatic or semi-automatic most of the time. Okay? A full automatic controller uses all magnetic contactors. All the operator has to do is get the controller switch in automatic, and from that point on, the controller's in charge. It performs all its functions as demanded by the automatic switch. But there's one point we better make here. A full automatic can only provide one kind of low voltage protection. That's low voltage release. This type of controller is ordinarily used on motors that have to operate within very specific limits. For example, you might find full automatics in air compressors and heating systems. On an air compressor, a pressure switch would be used to start and stop the compressor's motor. In a heating system, it would be a thermostat. Now, it's likely that most of the controllers you'll be dealing with will come under the heading of semi-automatic. They're used most often because they're very flexible and they give the operator complete control over the motor. Like the full automatic, they use all magnetic contactors. But semi-automatic controllers are operated by a manually operated switch. It could be right on the controller or it could be at a remote control station some distance away. Okay, we know how magnetic controllers are classified, but within these classifications, you'll find some that are named after their starting features, like an across-the-line controller or a reduced voltage start controller. You'll probably be working with controllers with a reduced voltage starting feature most of the time. This feature protects the DC motor armature circuit from high starting currents by putting resistors in series with the armature circuit when the motor is started. Now, this has the effect of decreasing the voltage and therefore the current to the armature circuit. Time delay relays are used to remove these resistances from the armature circuit in steps. As each step of resistance is removed, the motor speeds up until full motor speed is reached. 
The other type we mentioned, the across the line controller, connects the motor directly to the line at full voltage. Now, even though a controller with this feature can also provide overload protection and low voltage protection, you're not likely to see an across the line DC controller very often because they don't provide armature protection when the motor is started. Well, what have we covered here? We've talked about how DC motor controllers are classified. We mentioned two characteristics of manual controllers briefly. And we've talked about the two types of magnetic controllers, full automatic and semi-automatic, and have seen examples of each. We also mentioned a couple of different starting features that can be incorporated into controllers. Now, we'll stop here so you can review the material in the text on controller classification and answer the questions that pertain to that section. And then we'll be back to cover the types of symbols you'll need to know to understand diagrams of controllers. You must be able to read controller diagrams. They're absolutely vital documents to an electrician. Without them, well, it's just about impossible to locate troubles in a controller. Make changes to it or to install a new one if you need to. And the first step toward being able to read this document is to learn a new alphabet, a whole new set of symbols. There are hundreds and hundreds of them as opposed to the basic 26 in R alphabet, but they're just as important. In this segment, we're going to describe some of the most common symbols used in controller diagrams, how they're labeled and how they're used. Being able to recognize them immediately is important. It will save you from having to pause and look them up while you're reading a diagram. We may show you more than one symbol for the same item. If we do, it's because they're each commonly used and you'll see them in your day-to-day -day work. And by the way, if you should come across a symbol that's absolutely foreign to you, most of the time you'll find a legend printed at the bottom of the diagram or supplied on a separate sheet that will explain it. Now the legend gives the meaning of each symbol used in the diagram. Okay? The first few symbols we're going to look at all relate to conductors. A single line like this indicates a wire or conductor. This one indicates that conductors cross each other without being connected together. This one indicates a junction point where conductors are connected together. And here's one that's a little different, but it still goes with conductors. This is the symbol for a ground. Now sometimes symbols refer to both an item and the position of an item, like this set of contacts here. These are called normally open and normally closed contacts. Whenever you see a symbol that refers to a position of an item, remember it's the position that item's in when the electromagnet that operates it is de-energized. In other words, that's the position of the item when the controller shut off. The position may change as soon as the controller is energized, but that's not the point. You can always figure out what's happening if you just remember that the position is as indicated when whatever operates the item is de-energized. Now here's the same symbol for normally open contact with a letter designation. The TC means time to close, or you might see TDC, which means time delayed to close. Now, as we said before, these contacts are open when the coil which operates them is de-energized. However, even if the controller energizes the contactor that closes these contacts, they won't close right away. This symbol indicates that they'll only close a predetermined amount of time after the contactor is energized. This is the symbol for normally closed contacts. Time to open or time delay to open. They work exactly like the set that we just saw, except that these contacts will open a fixed period of time after their contactor is energized. Here are two common symbols for a coil. Coils usually have a letter or number designation with them, so you can follow the sequences of the operation of all contacts operated by the coil. Each of the contacts operated by a coil carries the same letter or number designation as the coil. Now, if the coil controls more than one set of contacts,
then each set will have a letter-number combination to designate exactly which set of contacts it is. You can see an example here. Some of these contacts are normally open and others are normally closed. Remember now, when the coil is energized, the position of these contacts will change. The next set of symbols we're going to look at relate to switches. This is the symbol for a single throw switch. A single throw switch can only be in an open or a closed position. These are push button symbols. This indicates normally open and this normally closed. When you see this, you'll know you're dealing with what's called a momentary switch. This switch will only stay closed as long as you hold it in. As soon as you let go, it returns to the normally open position. The normally closed position with the momentary switch symbol works just the opposite. The switch will only be open while you hold it in. These next two sets of symbols usually indicate a master switch. The term master switch refers to a device that governs the operation of contactors or relays. On this one, the normally open switch will be the start and the normally closed switch will be the stop. This type of master switch is a maintaining push button. When this button is pushed, it goes in and stays in, keeping its contacts closed. It also pushes the other button out, closing its contacts. The symbols for limit switches look like this. A limit switch is a mechanically actuated switch that operates when a mechanical device reaches its limit. This one's normally open, and this one's normally closed. These are symbols used for a pressure switch. As pressure rises, this one closes. This one opens on rising pressure. These are the symbols that represent resistors. These are fixed resistors. These are the symbols for variable resistors or rheostats. Variable resistors are usually represented like this. Rheostats like this one, however, are exceptions. If you aren't sure, check the legend. Well, we're just about through. This indicates a fuse. This one's for an overload coil. The symbol for an indicating light looks like this. The letter in the symbol gives you the color of the light. Well, a single glance at each symbol isn't enough to teach you what they mean, and it's not intended to. What we wanted to do was go over the most typical ones briefly and explain what they're for. If you turn to your text, you'll be able to take your time and look them over. Now, the next thing we're going to do is read some diagrams, and you can make it a lot easier on yourself if you learn the alphabet first. Here's a schematic diagram of a DC controller. No need to panic. We're not going to do anything much with this one just yet. But when we're through with this unit, you'll be able to read it. I just want to use it to point out that a controller has two circuits in it. This is the motor or power circuit that controls the motor. This one is the control or pilot circuit. The pilot circuit controls the controller. Here's another type of diagram of the controller we just saw. It's called a wiring diagram. A wiring diagram shows the physical location of all the components, contactors, resistors, fuses, etc. in the controller. Now even though these diagrams look totally different, they're exactly the same, electrically speaking. When we're actually working on a controller, we'll use the wiring diagram. But right now, we're going to look at a schematic diagram of a controller. We'll use lots of the symbols we described earlier. Let's look at the motor circuit first. Okay, we have our two line leads, positive and negative, two normally open contacts, and the motor. This diagram of a motor may seem familiar. You've probably seen it before. It's a compound motor. You can see the series field in series with the armature and a shunt field in parallel with the armature. The next thing we need is a control circuit. We want to use a magnetic contactor to start and stop this motor. We're going to use a coil to operate these two normally open contacts. 
Now, since this is a schematic diagram, we don't have to worry about placing each component according to where it would be in the controller, but they must be in the correct place electrically. We'll use the letter M to identify the coil, and we need to put the M over these contacts too to show that they're operated by the M coil. In order to stop and start this motor, we need a switch in our control circuit. We'll use a maintaining master switch. It should be here in series with the M coil, so we can de-energize the coil. Okay? Now, if the power's on, we should be able to start the motor. The first step is to push the start button in. Now, as we've said, with a maintaining master switch, these contacts remain closed. All right, starting with the negative line, let's trace a path for current flow back to the positive line. Current flows from the negative line through these closed contacts, through the M coil, back to the positive line. The M coil is energized. It's normally open contacts close, and the motor is connected to the line. So we have a path for current flow from the negative line through this conductor, through this closed contact, through the series field, through the armature, through this closed contact to the positive line. We also have a path for current flow from this negative line lead here, through the shunt field, back to the positive line. As of now, we can say, this motor's operating. Okay, let's see if we can stop it. Push the stop button. The start button comes out and stays out, so its contacts are open. That means that there's no path for current flow through the M coil, so it's de-energized. With the M coil de-energized, all of its contacts return to their de-energized position, which is normally open. The motor stops. Well, what have we got so far? We have a motor circuit and a control circuit. We've put in a contactor that starts and stops the motor. The next thing we should do is provide protection for the motor. We'll use a solder pot type thermal overload device for that. When we talked about thermal overload devices earlier, we said the heater element is always connected in series with the armature. So they'll both carry the same current. Okay, let's put the heater coil here. Remember that device we talked about that used a solder pot, a ratchet wheel, and contacts? Now, even though the solder pot will be heated by this element, we're going to put the contacts here in the control circuit in series with the M coil. These are spring-loaded, normally closed contacts, held closed by the ratchet wheel. They'll only open when the solder melts and lets the ratchet wheel turn. Looks like we're ready to see if our controller will do what we want it to again. Let's see if it can protect the motor. Push the start button. Starting at the negative line, let's trace the path for current flow. From the negative line, through the master switch close contacts, through the M coil, through the motor overload normally close contacts, back to the positive line. The M coil is energized, so it closes its normally open contacts. The motor starts. Now, if this motor became overloaded, it would slow down, right? CEMF would decrease and current flow would increase. What happens then? All the current flow in this motor circuit goes through this heater. We'll trace it out and see. Starting at the negative line, through the closed M contacts, through the series field, through the armature, to the positive line. All the current in the motor circuit does go through the overload heater. If current is excessive, it causes the element to heat up and melt the solder. Then the ratchet wheel turns, and the overload devices normally close contacts open. Okay, now let's trace the path for current flow again. From the negative line, through the master switch close contacts, through the M coil to the open overload contacts. We don't have a complete path for current flow, so the M coil is de-energized. The M contacts return to the normally open position and the motor stops. At this point, 
we can say the controller will start and stop the motor and protect it from overloads. What other form of protection can a controller provide? Low voltage protection. The question is whether it's LVP protection or LVR. This controller provides one of the two. It's the switch that actually determines which type it is. Let's operate the controller again and find out. Push the start button. Its contacts are closed and the M coil is energized. The M coil contacts operate. The motor starts. All right, let's drop the voltage until the M coil can't overcome the spring tension of the contactor and it drops back. The closed M contacts open and the motor stops. Now we'll say voltage returns to normal. What happens? The M coil can operate its contacts and the motor starts again. What does this tell you? Well, first of all, the operator didn't have to do anything to make the motor restart. As soon as the voltage returned to normal, the controller operated and the motor started up again. Now, when we talked about the two types of voltage protection devices, we said LVP protection requires that the operator restart the motor. So that's not what we've got here. The motor restarts automatically when voltage returns to normal. So what we've got is LVR protection or low voltage release. That's what I meant when I said the switch determines what kind of protection you've got. LVR must have a maintaining master switch. Well, what we've got here is an across-the-line controller equipped to provide the motor overload protection and low voltage release protection. But what about the controller itself? We haven't built anything into the controller to protect it. Now look at the diagram and you'll see what I mean. Any of these components in the controller could fail and damage it. To prevent damage of that sort, we can put a fuse here in the control circuit. Okay, let's see if it works. Let's say there's a short across the M coil and the fuse blows. That would mean there is an open in the control circuit. So no current can flow through it and the motor stops. Now both the controller and the motor are protected and by making a couple of simple changes in this diagram, we can add a different feature to the controller. Let's remove the maintaining master switch and install a momentary master switch. The new switch works differently. Remember, when you push the button, you close the contacts, but as soon as you remove your finger, the push button goes back to its original position and its contacts open again. All right, we've removed the maintaining master switch and installed a momentary master switch. Let's also install a set of normally open contacts here and connect them in parallel with the start switch. We want these operated by the M coil, so they should be lettered M. Now push the start button and trace out the current path. From the negative line, through the normally closed stop switch, through the start switch, which is held closed, through the M coil. The M coil is energized now. It closes its contacts and the motor starts. Now I want you to notice specifically which contacts were operated when the M coil was energized. The M contacts that start the motor closed. So did this contact that we put in parallel with the momentary start push button. This normally open contact is now closed. Even when we release the start button and its contacts open, we still have a path for current flow. We go through these closed M contacts and right through the rest of the control circuit. So the motor continues to operate. The circuit is frequently called the maintaining circuit. In other words, it maintains a path for current through the M coil after the start switch is released. Now let's see which feature changing the master switch gave us. You've probably figured it out, but let's go through the drill anyway. Let's say there's a voltage drop. The M coil can't hold its contacts closed, so all the M coil contacts open and the motor stops. Now let's return the voltage to normal and trace our path for current flow through the control circuit from the negative line through the stop switch to the start switch. Its contacts are open, so there's no path here. 
What about the M contacts in parallel with the start switch? Well, since the M coil is de-energized, these contacts are open, so we can't go this way either. This controller won't restart its motor when voltage returns to normal. The feature we added was LVP protection. This controller must be restarted by the operator after a voltage drop. And you'll find that any controller that uses a momentary master switch offers low voltage protection. Reading a schematic diagram isn't really that difficult after all, is it? Especially if you build it yourself. Now, we're going to go on and add even more features to this controller in a minute. But why don't we stop now so you can review what we've just done and make sure you understand the hows and the whys completely. Well, we had a diagram of a controller that stopped, started, and protected the motor from overloads. And we built in two different types of low voltage protection as well. A controller can do much more than that. One of the things we've added to this controller is armature protection. Now, before we explain how we did it, let's talk about why armature protection is needed. You see, if full voltage is applied to the motor, it's too much for the armature to handle on starts. Now, I don't mean to say the motor can't ever handle it. It's designed to use full line voltage, but only after the CEMF has built up because it's the difference between the applied voltage and the counter EMF that controls current flow through the armature. So, we need to limit current during starting and then remove the limit as the motor speeds up. How did we build in armature protection? Well, it was easy. All we needed was some resistance, and we got it by putting these resistors in here in series with the armature. They'll provide protection on starts because they decrease the amount of voltage applied to the armature. This also decreases the amount of current flow going through it. The next thing we did was make it possible for this motor to run in both directions. Now in DC motors, you have to reverse the direction of current flow through the armature in order to change the direction of rotation. So we put these four contacts here in the motor circuit. You'll see how these are operated in just a minute. But first, we have to look at the control circuit. We've installed a switch that can give us forward and reverse control. Now, instead of one M coil, we have two. One for forward, labeled F, and one for reverse, labeled R. They're here in parallel with each other and in series with the new switch. We've also installed a couple of normally closed contacts here in series with these two coils. They're labeled R up here and F down here. We're about halfway through our additions now, so hold on. We have two more coils here in parallel with the F and R coil. And we have a couple of sets of normally open contacts here in series with these coils. They're labeled F and R. These contacts are in parallel with each other. Okay, these two coils are going to be time delay relays. This one's TC1 and this one's TC2. They're going to be used to cut out these two resistors here in series with the armature. They'll operate these two sets of normally open contacts up here in parallel with the resistors. Now while we're here, let's check the label on these contacts we have around the armature. These two are R and these two are F. We have two more sets of contacts here in parallel with the forward and reverse switches. Okay, that's the end of the changes and additions to the diagram. Let's trace a current flow and make the controller operate. As we do, we'll mention each part, why it's here, and what it does to make the controller work. Okay, let's check out the control circuit first, starting at L1. We trace from here, through the fuse, through the normally closed stop switch. So far, nothing's new, right? Okay, now let's go this way to the forward switch. The switch is normally open, so let's push it to make it close and go on. Through this closed forward switch, through this normally closed contact labeled R, we'll get back to this in a moment, through the F coil, through the normally closed OL contacts, 
back to L2. We now have a complete path for current flow from L1 to L2 through the F coil, and it is energized. Okay, the F coil operates its contacts. Let's check out the F contacts and see what position they're in and what's happened. Let's look up here in the motor circuit first. These normally open F contacts are now closed. Okay, let's check out our motor circuit and see if our motor works. Starting at line L1, through these two resistors, through the series field, up this line, through the closed F contacts, down through the armature, through these closed F contacts, through the overload heater to L2. The armature is energized and the motor starts. The shunt field is also energized. Look at it to be sure. Okay, now the motor's running, but it's not running at full speed. Remember, we put all this resistance here in series with the armature to protect it. Well, since we don't have full line voltage applied to the armature, we have less current flow. That also means that the magnetic field in the armature is weaker and motor action is slower. So, the motor runs slower. If we want to operate this motor at a low speed, we'd be all right, but we don't. So, we've got to remove this resistance some way. These normally open contacts here are going to be part of the solution. In order to see how, let's get back down here in the control circuit and continue with the F contacts. This F contact here, in parallel with the forward start switch, so the forward switch can be released. All right, let's check out the remaining F contacts. This set of normally closed contacts here in series with the R coil are now open. Down here, there's a set of normally open F contacts in series with these TC coils. These contacts are now closed. Let's go on and get this controller operating. Let's trace a path for current flow through this control circuit and see if it gives us a way to protect the armature and get speed up to normal. We'll start here at this junction point at the forward start switch and go down to this junction at the reverse start switch. Now there's no path for current flow through here because the start button is open and these normally open R contacts are still open. So let's go on down to this next junction point. We do have a path for current flow through these closed F contacts, so the TC1 and TC2 coils are energized. Now remember, TC means time to close, so there'll be a time delay between the time these coils are energized and the time they operate their contacts. This controller is now energized. More specifically, all the contactors needed to make this motor run in the forward direction are energized, and have operated or will operate their contacts. Let's go back up to the motor circuit and see what happens when TC1 and TC2, the relays that operate these contacts, go into operation. First, let's say that TC1 has closed these contacts. What happens is that we bypass this resistor. You know that current follows the path of least resistance. That's why most of the current will flow through this set of closed contacts rather than through this resistor. Bypassing the resistor also means that the voltage to the armatures increased, so we have more current flow and faster motor action now. The motor is speeded up and it will continue to increase speed until CEMF builds up to the new level. At some predetermined period of time after TC1 is closed, TC2 closes and the same sequence of events occurs. The armature voltage increases and current flow increases. The motor speeds up, the CEMF goes up. We have removed both resistors at this stage of operation. The motor is directly across the line with full line voltage applied to the series field and the armature. The shunt field is also across the line. In this condition, the motor is at normal speed. Okay, let's go over what we've done one more time. First of all, the controller can start and stop the motor. It can protect the armature. We've also shown that it can remove the resistances that are put in at the start so that the motor can run at normal speed. 
We also modified the diagram so the motor could run in two directions. But all this time, we've had the motor running in forward direction. All that's left to do is make it run in reverse. We'll push the reverse start button and trace the path for current flow. Starting here at L1, we go down through the fuse, down to the reverse start switch, through its closed contacts to this open F contact. But we have to stop here. There's no path for current flow through the R coil, so it's not energized. Now, right at the moment, we can't make this motor run in reverse. Why? Right, because it's already running in the forward direction. This is how the controller prevents the motor from trying to run in forward and reverse at the same time. See, we connected this normally closed F contact in series with the R coil. Well, this contact is an electrical interlock. It will not allow the R coil to become energized as long as the F coil is energized. When the shoe's on the other foot, the same thing happens. This normally closed R contact up here in series with the F coil performs the same interlock function. If the R coil was energized, it would open this normally closed R contact and the F coil could not be energized. This controller has to be stopped before the motor can be made to reverse direction. Well, we've done the two things we said we'd done. We built in protection for the armature, and we've built a controller that can change the direction of the rotation of the motor. Why don't you turn to your text now? You'll find a copy of the schematic diagram we've just been working on. Read over the material we've just covered in your text and answer the questions you'll find there. We'll be back as soon as you're finished to talk about one more feature. I mentioned one more feature and we're going to do it now. We can get this controller to give us what's called speed control above normal. As you saw earlier, one of the byproducts of protecting the armature against high current flow on starts was below normal speed. The controller wasn't designed to deliver speed control below normal, but we got it anyway. To get speed control above normal in this controller, we use a rheostat. Now a rheostat's just a variable resistor connected in series with the shunt field. What we're going to do with this rheostat is manipulate current flow. Basically, we want to reduce the CEMF in the motor so that we can get an increase in current flow that gives us faster motor action. The progression goes like this. First, we increase the resistance in series with the shunt field. That means the voltage to the shunt field is decreased. When voltage goes down, current flow goes down. Now, when current flow through the field coils decreases, their magnetic fields get weaker. And with a weakened magnetic field, you have a decrease in CEMF. Now, since CEMF is down, the current flow through the armature increases and motor actions faster. The motor speeds up until the motion is fast enough to generate enough CEMF to limit the current flow in the armature. Then the motor speed will be constant again. That's how a rheostat connected in series with the shunt field can give us speed control above normal. Now, I need to say a couple of words of caution here. First of all, whenever you're starting a DC motor that's equipped with speed control above normal, be sure there's no resistance in series with the shunt field. If there is, it's going to take much longer than usual to generate enough CEMF to get the current flow through the armature down to an acceptable level. And that high current over a prolonged period of time could damage the armature. Secondly, if for some reason you have to remove the rheostat, don't start the motor until the rheostat's back in place. Now look at this diagram and you'll see why. If you remove the rheostat, the shunt field is open. That means you're dealing with a series motor instead of a compound motor. And a series motor will run away with itself if it's operated without a load. Well, before we leave this controller, there's one more diagram or chart I want you to look at. It's called a sequencing chart. 
This chart shows the position that all the contactors and relays are in when the controller's in different positions. In this case, the chart shows their position when the controller's in off, in forward, and in reverse. This X indicates the device has operated. Look at the off position line. None of the contactors or relays have operated. Now, in the forward position, we can see that the F contactor has operated. The TC1 and TC2 relays have operated too. In the reverse position, the R contactor has operated along with TC1 and TC2. These charts come in handy when you've got a controller problem. The chart tells you what devices are supposed to have operated according to what position the master control switch is in. As soon as you find a device that's not in the position indicated on the chart, you've got a good place to start looking for trouble. And by the way, bear in mind that the chart only indicates the contactor or relay that's in operation. It doesn't give the position of their contacts, okay? Well, we've built us a mighty fine controller. It's got just about everything that any controller needs to control a single DC motor. This controller gives the motor overload protection and low voltage protection, and it protects itself too. It allows the operator to control the direction in which the motor turns, and it gives speed control above normal speed. It also puts resistance in series with the armature circuit to protect the armature against high starting current and removes the resistance automatically. Now, why don't you look over the diagram of the controller in your text and see if you can get the motor to run in reverse. You'll have to stop it first, and it's just about time to do that anyway. If you've got any questions about anything we've said or done here, be sure to ask your instructor about them.